Hi everyone in the UK. Uh, my name is Brian Lewis. I am one of the designers of Dinosaur World and the Dinosaur Island Roar and Right. And I have with me. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Marissa Mazzara, also one of the designers of Roar and Right and Dinosaur World. And I, Tim David McGregor, <laughs> also uh, one of the, the co-designers uh, of these dinosaur titles. Games. <laughs> <laughs> games. Yeah, we're, we're here to answer some questions that uh, they sent over to us. So um, yeah, let's get to it. Um, so uh, we've introduced ourselves. What's next? Go ahead. Oh, um, Ryan, can you tell us a little bit more about Dinosaur World? Well, yes, I can. <laughs> I don't <hope> so. <laughs> you don't say. Uh, you don't say. Uh, so Dinosaur World is a standalone game set in the Dinosaur Island universe. Um, and some people say, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, what we did was we took some of the aspects of Dinosaur Island and put them in a new game. Uh, so people still felt like they were playing Dinosaur Island, but with new mechanics, if that makes sense. So people could get a new experience while still having some familiarity with the with the old stuff, if you will. So I think um, I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised. Crossing my fingers, I hope they like it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so Dave, so I've talked a little bit about uh, Dinosaur World. What about Dinosaur Island Roar and Right? Uh, yeah, the Roar and Right, um, Roar and Right, I should say. Um, you know, is is. Uh, roll and write uh, in the Dinosaur Island world, of course, but um, I think it does, I'm kind of jumping into another question that's asked a little later, but I think it does some interesting things. It uh, has a lot of engine building. You're using kind of uh, the tetraminos or the tetraminos uh, for buildings. I have a prototype board here. Let me find it. Uh, this is very, I should have found a better one than this, but uh, where you're, you know, I don't know how well you guys can see that, but you're building little things. This is one of our earliest prototypes. And uh, those buildings do things, um, which you know, earn money, you're making dinosaurs, you're collecting DNA. Um, there's all sorts of uh, kind of new roar and or <laughs> roll and write mechanics in it. Uh, and I will say, uh, it was heavily inspired by Fleet the Dice game. So it has this kind of, I love the idea of uh, you make some check marks and then those check marks activate. So they do hmm. something. So we wanted yeah. to ensure that there was some sort of uh, activation. So I, I know it's kind of vague, but uh, you'll see more. It's, it's hard without the, the, you know, physical boards in front of us, but uh, yeah, it's fun. Sure. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, how do these worlds link to that of Dinosaur Island? Brian, that's a, definitely a question for you. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, we'll probably talk about this later on, but if we don't, now's a good time. Uh, when we originally started designing Dinosaur World, that was an expansion for Dinosaur Island. So we kept a lot of the mechanics. And as we play tested and came up with ideas, it kind of morphed into the, its own being. And at one point we just said, this isn't an expansion. This is a totally new experience. So let's just break free of those bonds and um, do our thing. And I think that just opened up so much. Um, and it really, I think, really, um, made for a fun game. Uh, Dinosaur Island Roar, Roar and Write, funny enough, is based on Dinosaur Island, because uh, but it plays differently. But you'll, you'll notice a lot of the same mechanics. The specialists are in there, the, the, the dinosaurs and the draft and the DNA. But the way it does it is very clever. Um, and I think um, that one kind of bridges the gap, if you will. It's like Dinosaur Island, then you've got Dinosaur Island Roar and Write, which came first with us right mm -hmm. um and then dinosaur world so i thought that was um you'll see some of the same dinosaurs maybe some of the same specialists uh but you'll see new stuff as well right and honestly some of the mechanics that we came up with for the roar and right roar and right uh they actually kind of uh were then transported into dinosaur world so yeah uh, we kind of came up with this dinosaur island themed thing and and then yeah. it kind of More. influenced and changed into a, a bigger uh, game later, so. Yeah, for sure. All right, Dave, how did you evoke the element of controlled chaos in Dinosaur World? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that was something we worked with. So, so with Dinosaur Island, there's a variety of ways, you know, we've got to threat and um, you've got the hooligan bag and all that stuff. And um, when we set out with this one, I think we wanted to mitigate some of that, like chaos and luck, but also uh, maybe make it more focused on the dinos. So 
Um, we made deaths at the end maybe a bit more punitive in this game, so you definitely want to watch out for that and raise your security. And then, but one of the ways that you know you're, it's unpredictable is when you visit dinos, you roll threat dice, and they just give you death. And each uh, type of dino, be it herbivore, small carnivore, or large carnivore, has a different threat die. Um, and uh, obviously, small or large carnivores, rather, you know, being the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and those of you who collect death tokens, and then you basically compare those at the end with the other park. And, and uh, you don't want to accumulate much more than your neighbor. Uh, that's for certain. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was it. that was a tough. That was I don't want to say it was a tough nut to crack, but there was a lot of testing involved with doing that. Um, <laughs> but on the other side, you know, Marissa, we're we're going to talk about the Roar and Right for a second. Um, what sets that apart from other roll and rights? Because you know, right now in the market, there's so many, so many roll and rights and what makes this one different so the big thing for us i feel like when we went into it was we really wanted to bridge the gap between like a roll and write engine builder and a roll and write worker placement game mm -hmm. so we brought in these worker placement aspects and we wanted that board to feel tight but also that you could do what you wanted and then have that sort of engine building ramp up really quickly so having lots of activations to get a lot of goodies to make a really robust park i felt like yeah. really sets it apart from others you know i should know the answer to this but i can't think off the top of my head are there can you think of any other roll and rights that have a worker placement element I really can't. Not that I know of, and I haven't played them all, but uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't played them all either. But you know, I, th I think that makes it unique too. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's next? Oh, I, I'm <laughs> up. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is definitely a question for Brian. I know you have a history with roller to roller coaster tycoon. Uh, yeah. So is this roller coaster tycoon with dinosaurs? <laughs> I. <sighs> I, okay, so that be first. Let me start off by saying, I was addicted to Roller Coaster Tycoon <laughs> when I was a when I don't want to say when I was a kid because I wasn't a kid. I was <laughs> in my twenties, I think, maybe thirties. I don't remember now. But I played number one, number two came out, and I must have played that eight hours a day. I was addicted to that game, and then three came, and it became three D, and I was like, this is awful. <laughs> but um, so I didn't play that. But it's funny, I, I have an account on Steam. I downloaded Roller Coaster Tycoon on that just to play it on my on my computer because I miss it so much. So the question though was, was though, <laughs> is this roller coaster tycoon with dinosaurs? I would say there is more of an emphasis on the park as opposed to the like um carnage of dinosaurs. And I know that's what some people want. I don't People will get a little bit of that, but it's not the main emphasis. This is about building your park, activating it, making sure people go visit the dinosaurs and they may eat you or trample you or, or you know, cause some death. But as they do. It, as they do, as one <laughs> does in a, a dinosaur park. Um, but it is really about activating the park and building the dinosaurs as opposed to, you know, running from a T-Rex, right? So I hope that answers that. <laughs> yes. So what's fun about dinosaurs? Uh, what's fun about, <laughs> what, what isn't fun about dinosaurs? I mean, uh, I know this again is kind of like, we obviously previewed these questions and uh, yeah. I've loved dinosaurs for my entire life. And, um, and I, we're going to mention, you know, Jurassic Park, but, but I literally have seen that movie 13 times in theaters. It came out at the perfect time in my life. I was, yeah. It was uh, what I was 12 or 13 when it came out. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. And it was, one, I was one of those annoying people who like, if my neighbor was going, you know, like the neighbor boy down, like my yeah. friend, I would be like, hey, hey, can I go? Uh, and I remember yeah. any opportunity, um, the, this, this neighbor in question, his mother's a sign language interpreter. And at the time he was doing a sign language interpretation of the film in real time. Like it was the nineties, it was before they had like the picture in picture. And so we, I attended that just to see it again. Uh, so it was 12 times in 1994 and then a 13th time when they did the like HD remaster a few years so ago, right, 10 years ago. I'm, I am going to beat you on this one, but it's not with Jurassic Park or Jurassic World or, or any of those movies. It's with Star Wars, the original. Oh, I bet. 1977. I saw it 17 times in the theater. Wow. I was seven years old. Okay. That's, I'm telling you how old I am. I'm going to be 50 <laughs> this year, everyone. Um, I know I don't look it, but I am. <laughs> so, but um, 
it was a dollar to see a movie back then, right? Wow. So we lived close enough to the theater where we would just walk to the theater, mm -hmm. me and my brothers, um, and we would go see it. And we're thinking we're really cool because we would go into the theater and then we would stick around in the theater to watch it a second time and they wouldn't come in and kick us out. <laughs> so we're thinking as kids, oh, we're so cool. Little, little do we know our parents are going, yes, they're <laughs> gone for four or five hours, you know, yeah. uh, not thinking about the, the parents are like, thank God for movies, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, getting back to Jurassic uh, <laughs> Park, I did see that in the theater. I was in grad school. I remember watching that and being amazed mm -hmm. at the um, CGI that was in that because nothing had ever been done like that before right. to that extent. And it was incredible. And that really, I still remember, and it's iconic, the the, the, the T-Rex footprint coming down, like the T-Rex yes, coming yeah. foot coming down and everything. Or the, or the water. Another, yeah, I have another... Uh, dinosaur anecdote because we get we kind of got lost in Jurassic Park but really it's about yeah. how awesome dinosaurs are <laughs> I had this memory of grade school and um I came home one day and I was talking to my mom I'm like why did you name me David like I was just not flattered by my name like none of us love our name and she's mm -hmm. like well what would you have rather been called and I legitimately and 100 this is a true story said Tyrannosaurus Rex <laughs> and she just gave me a look like, okay. I thought you were going to say Malcolm <laughs> yeah I know so Tyrannosaurus Rex but uh, that's but yeah, for me, like, I think dinosaurs are so cool because they're just that unsolved mystery still. <laughs> like, you dig them up and you don't know what you're going to find. And I feel very much like, again, hearkening back to the movie at the beginning when Grant's looking at the bones and he's getting all upset that the helicopter is ruining the dig site. <laughs> just that for me, like, the wonder that dinosaurs bring, I think is super cool. Mm -hmm. But all moving right. on a little bit. What advice would you all give to help stop dinosaurs from eating people? I mean, Chris Pratt, he just does <laughs> yeah. like one of these. Well, good. No, does. come on, you gotta go, you gotta go old school. Don't move. They can't yeah. see you if you don't they move. They can't see you. No, you gotta run to the bathroom. Oh wait, no, that right. guy gets eaten. Yeah, that guy gets eaten. <laughs> and it was a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> so um, run, no, probably not. Um, stand still, also stand still. probably no. Yeah. <laughs> no, Depending on what the, they are. Just the prep. The, I guess oh. so. Basically, uh, start taking some classes now on how to train a dinosaur using hand signals. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Which of these two games is your favorite? So we're talking about the Roran right yes. and the right. world. Um, I yeah. It, it's funny because when we were creating the Roran right, it was very exciting and. I probably would have, you know, picked that and that was it. But as we uh, continued to work on Dinosaur World um, and it evolved from an expansion to this real thing and we started bringing in those mechanics from Dinosaur Island and, and the Roar and Ride and just all the crazy ideas that we were coming yeah. up with, I think that definitely uh, won the day in the end for me. I know, I hate to say it too, um, but it was just this nice evolution of ideas. We had so many big ideas for the Roll and Write or Roar and Write that mm -hmm. just aren't feasible in that space. So being able to bring them to life in another way, it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I do appreciate though that the Roar and Write is super quick and you do get a really satisfying, like crunchy game out of it, so. Yeah, yeah. I hate that this question is making me pull a Sophie's Choice. <laughs> yeah. you know? How do you choose um, one of your children? Yeah. Um, oh, it's quite easy. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I like them both. And I, I know that's a cop out answer. But like for the same reason Marissa said that one really is a quicker play and, and can get to the table probably more often because it's you can play it and it's it's more it's not filler because it is stinky and heavier, but it is a quicker play. Yeah. Um, uh, Unless, with like the, there's less uh, stuff and setup, right. you just kind of right. grab some dice, grab the boards, and go. Right. Um, with the um, dinosaur world, that is a more, I don't want to say more satisfying, but that's the word that comes to my head. Um, it's more Completely puzzly maybe, thinky. Like, you know. It's more puzzly thinky. And so uh, when you're done, like, even if I lost, I feel like I made something, yes. you know, like I did something, maybe my park wasn't the best, but I did the best that I thought I could, that I, that as I did it, right? Mm -hmm. right. So, and it's just so much um, more visual where like the Roran right, we do have, you have, and I have one here, it's so terrible, but like this, you know, finished park, it's like a <laughs> blueprint of a park. This is an early prototype, but right, right. Um, 
you know, so you have something there too, where it's like, oh, I made that, but it's it's much cooler and prettier in world. And once those pieces, you know, started to come to life, it's like, whoa, yeah. that's that's cool. Yeah. So, so this game um, evokes a little nostalgia for love of dinosaurs. Obviously, we know that from backers and, and past <laughs> campaigns. They just love dinosaurs. Um, and so, how much of this uh, love of dinosaurs factored into the design process? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> anyone not to, you know, throw too much towards Jurassic Park or whatever. But again, there is a strong love there for all the movies. And so keeping things thematic with some that, of the movies, so, most of the movies, true, maybe, but right? <laughs> we don't talk about number three. <laughs> yeah, But just thinking back to those good times was helpful in designing the game that we wanted to play, I feel like. I mean, it's just fun to have those cultural touchstones mm -hmm. while you're, you know, throwing together ideas and, yeah. uh, you know, just coming up with these stupid ideas that were influenced by movies or, again, just dinosaurs and just I think all kids kind of love dinosaurs. And so by diving into that space, uh, you're just naturally kind of remembering your childhood. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, next. Uh, we we kind of touched upon this, but uh, it's tricky to think dinosaurs without Jurassic Park. Uh, how much do you feel it was influenced? Uh, well, uh, go ahead, I mean, Brian. I mean, I mean, I mean we have never had any secret that this is its own unique IP, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are, <laughs> I mean, Holy it's no original, life. never been done. Never been done. Uh, I'm working on a book right now. Um, <laughs> but it, it it is heavily influenced, but that's because of the love of the material, right? Um, when the original was designed, uh, my John with John, um, that was, I tell the story, you know, the quick story is that we were walking down the street at Origins, we walked by this pizza place and there was a sign in the window that said Dinosaur World um, at Columbus Zoo. And I was like, that's a game, you know, kind of thing. And he's like, well, let's work on it. And we did. And so we're like, well, so, you know, what are our inspirations? And, and you see that coming from Jurassic Park you know, you know, because of the dinosaurs. But we, John and I, you know, like I said earlier, both played those simulation games of like Roller Coaster Tycoon and, you know, Zoo Tycoon and all those games uh, when we were younger. Um, and so that heavily influenced the design process as well. So is there a direct influence from Jurassic Park? You bet. Um, <laughs> there's no denying it. And and the the winks and nods, I think you'll see um, in all the games. I got a gyroscope. <laughs> Rolling ball. Dinosaur. <laughs> That's going to be a Kickstarter exclusive. Yeah. Uh, Life-size one. Yes. Uh, now, now people don't, please don't hold me to that because that is not true at all. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got like a table in the center and you can play the game while right. traveling down the road. Or you, or just to go out in public uh, during yeah. uh, the pandemic. Yep. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go on. Um, so, Dave, um, do you have, do, or, or Marissa, either one, um, do you have any, do you, do, you, do you, can you think of any funny stories um, or, or um, exciting moments from the playtesting or, or, or just from the process of sure. designing yeah. the games? We, um, so early on, uh, that when we kind of envisioned this, um, we, uh, Actually, we're considering a campaign for Dinosaur Island. Which we're looking at episodic uh, content and expansion. Uh, again, yeah, yeah, and there's an expansion, correct? Yeah, and and then it just evolved into th this this thing that we've um, you know finished and in, in, in love. Uh, but uh, and so we threw a bunch of ideas on this uh, post this this poster board here, um, and I know you can't read it, but uh, in the process we were coming up with oh here's the geez, there's so much stuff. Um, so we had all these different episodes and, um, you know, it was a late night one night and we are uh, clever. They, the names on those are clever. <laughs> yeah. Read a couple. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we were, we were late into the design process. So it was probably the wee hours of the morning yeah. and, uh, and we were kind of just, we feel, felt like we had exhausted all ideas. And, and so finally we came up with this idea of sabotaging one another. Uh, we didn't know, it, it never got to playtesting, but it was this idea, maybe inspired by Lords of Waterdeep, where you had a mandatory quest you had to play on something or something they had to do. And we were basing it on uh, Dennis Nedry uh, from Dinosaur, or from Jurassic Park. Again, the perfect transition question from the previous one. 
Um, but I misspoke as I'm one to do. Uh, and I, I referred to him as, I believe his Seinfeld character is Newman, yeah. but I misspoke and said Nerman. <laughs> and so this character of Nerman <laughs> was just tormenting all of our designs. Um, and so uh -huh. yeah, we have um, a whole segment that said, hello, Nerman. <laughs> and uh, that became one of, the, one of the chapters. I know our, we're yeah. the only people that think this is funny because I know <laughs> no one else out there is laughing, but I still think it's funny. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in the moment, uh, you know, it was great because we were bashing our head against the wall trying to figure out like, what else can we do? How can we change this? Um, and then, read a couple more of those titles. I'm just curious. What else, what are um, some of the other episodes? Like Fatal Attractions, uh, Parks and Rex, R E X. Um, <laughs> Life Finds a Way, Spared No Expense. Again, Neil, leaning into right. the references. And then uh, you didn't say the magic word, AKA Hello, Nerman. <laughs> so those were some of them oh. there uh, on the the board. But yeah, um, the early days. I know, and and, and there's another, you know. Um, and it's not funny as much as, you know, just the power of going and playtesting in the con. We, we had a great moment where we were really struggling, struggling with the economy of the Roar and Write. Yeah. And we wanted to make it more diverse and we wanted to get more stuff into it, uh, but not make it overly complicated. And uh, in one of our playtests, and, and I don't know this woman's name. I, I, I have it written down in a notebook somewhere, but I don't know her name. Uh, but uh, yeah, she, she came up with a brilliant idea of, um, we have these income markers where you would earn money. Uh, and she said, well, why don't you just, make one security, one DNA, one money, or, or give the player the choice. And so we started play testing it like that. And eventually we just landed on kind of making those income markers uh, a little bit right. of everything. And, and instead of just yeah. getting money, you were getting a little bit of everything as your park developed. And it just solved so many issues. And so. Yeah, so I will say this from the funny aspect, um, when Dave had these ideas for the, for the Roar and Write, um, he initially wanted the, one of the end game conditions or second part of the game to be uh, the T-Rex is escaping from the park on jet skis. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, did. I mean, the yeah. idea was they would break out of the, they would leave their pens and, and they would try to flee as any right. cage reptile is wont to do. And right. so they would march slowly to the exits. And in my mind, when they got to the ex exits, they were just T-Rex sized jet skis that they would just zip out of there. <laughs> I'm out. Um, and uh, so I had this, you know, in my head from yeah. the get-go. And I'm so, telling you, Go ahead. I will say, look for look for an, a nod, maybe even a blatant like <laughs> aha in in Dinosaur World on that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we've seen some of the art already, and it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you tell us about the art direction and what we are trying to evoke, Brian? Yeah. So you know, unfortunately, as designers, we don't get a ton of say as to what uh, happens with the art design. But I do remember talking to Molly and Nathan, the owners. And, and, and pitching this dinosaur world game and saying, it'd be cool if it was a little bit in the future, you know, a little darker, a little grittier, um, a little bit more, you know, not as vibrant because the park is run down and you're trying to get started again. And it, it was, you know, this, you know, maybe let's say 10 years later kind of thing. Um, and they loved it. And so the main thing was, can we get Quan Chai Mar Mariah? Um, to do the art again. And um, he said, yes, and I, the, the covers. And I, I'm, I'm prejudiced, but they are, I honestly, I think some of the best artwork on a, on a, on a box cover. Um, I know. I agree. Yeah, I mean, just we all kind of have a bias here, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, I think they're awesome. They just exceeded my expectation. And what was cool is just kind of seeing them develop. You know, we saw some of the early pencil sketches and then we saw, you know, some of the original color and ideas and then things got, you know, moved and switched. And uh, ultimately he landed on something that I think is- Yeah, is and then awesome. um, the other artists, Joe and Andrew uh, mm -hmm. are doing art for the games. They're actually drawing things as well. They're brilliant. Uh, and then the, the whole head of it all is Steve-O, our, our graphic design uh, person in-house, who's just making it all work together and communicating with the artists. And this is what we want. And I'll tweak this. And, and he really has this cohesive, you know, um, uh, vision as to what it should be like. So that's how that came to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you were building, this is, uh, if you were building your own dinosaur park, what would yours look like, Marissa? Well, it makes me think of 
Disneyland a little bit or Disney World. So there would definitely have to be like raptor crowns that you could buy and wear <laughs> and probably a big bucket like that looks like a brontosaurus that holds all your popcorn I feel like I wish I would have had props because I have a lot of these things already sort of <laughs> yeah. um but just like dumb tchotchkes that you can buy for sure <laughs> and then obviously the jeep tour you gotta see like you gotta ride in the jeep and see all the sights so toys yeah that's that's about right with with her toys thing toys. yeah <laughs> yeah it's gotta have I know we talked about was it Jurassic Park three, the one with the aviary, like the all yeah. the birds or the, yeah. the, the like the flying dinos. That was so cool to me. That's a must. Expansion. You know, I think maybe the only thing that would be required in mine is a stall that sells elephant ears mm. or slash funnel cake. Yeah. Um, you gotta have that. We're missing that. Oh, and fries and fr cheese fries. Everyone just needs I a funnel cake like room in their house like is that right. something like let's make that a staple you just open it up or a button and funnel that's cake. something you often look like look for when you're looking for a house um, yes. your yeah. own Do you have funnel, a funnel cake room funnel cake room um, <laughs> okay um uh, okay well we'll start with uh you brian i mean uh tell us a bit about how you came to be a game designer oh that's a long story um <laughs> but the short version is I went to Origins in the U.S. In, in Columbus, Ohio, back in, I want to say 2007, 2008. And I had played strategy games before, but it had been a while. And I really didn't have a group or anything that I played with. And I was seeing someone at the time, and we went, and I um, remember playing these games and going, this is so much fun. And I signed up to learn how to play Race for the Galaxy. Um, and <laughs> I remember going, wow, this game is so good. Like I literally had to buy it at the show um, and took it home. And like, I played it um, multiple times. And, and it's like, that was like, I want to try and create something like this. Well, I did create something like it. As a matter of fact, it was pretty much Race for the Galaxy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, with a different theme. And the theme dinosaurs. was so generic. Dinosaurs? No, I don't even remember what the theme was, but it was super lame. I like it was not it was not good and I you remember kind race of for the galaxy yarn crossover <laughs> there you go I've got Merge some yarn those... back here know, um, right. <laughs> um but you know um I look at that and it wasn't good but you've got to start somewhere right so getting some feedback and it was hard hearing harsh feedback at first and it wasn't fun and so as I started to play more you know I started this gaming group and and uh, I had met Dave, Marissa, I didn't know you at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I started playing these games and I came up with this game called Titans of Industry. And um, I don't think that was its original title. It was, I, the original title was something so generic that I'm glad they changed it. Um, <laughs> but it was my first Kickstarter actually. It funded and it got printed and it was just super exciting to see that in print. Um, and from there, just kind of started going to prototype um, conventions. The proto spiels are some of the conventions we have here for uh, play testing and stuff like that. And um, met John at one, and that kind of opened up that. And we had mutual friends that I didn't even know at the time and just things like that. And so I started designing and then um, Dinosaur Island hit. Uh, Kickstarter and became what it is. And that was lucky, you know, right time, right place. Um, and then we were friends still. <laughs> um, and Marissa came around and um, that's when we designed our first game together. Yeah. Talk about oh, that. yeah. So, I mean, you want me to talk? I mean, uh, I guess uh, we could talk about Fungeon Party, right? Um, right. And, uh, I mean, yeah, so Fungeon Party is our, our first uh, published game as designers uh, with our friend Tom as well. And uh, that was kind of a crazy story where we were just hanging out. And uh, before you know it, we were tossing some dice. I think we were just having a game night. And uh, for some reason, I don't know, Brian, maybe we had a prototype of yours or something, because at this point, Brian was very much interested in pursuing this and, and having some mm -hmm. success. And, and Marissa and I and Tom, we weren't that interested, but we loved playing prototypes. Uh, and I got introduced to a lot of, you know, Brian's friends and, and subsequently my friends and John. And, and before you know it, I was going to Origins and, and these places and, and spending more time playtesting games and enjoying it 
Um, so anyway, I think we may have had a, a prototype or something and we had all these dice. We started throwing them around and, and, and coming up with all these crazy challenges. Like, can you stack 10 dice on your head or can you stack three dice and then drop on your nose, I think it was, and then drop yeah. them into a box. And so we started putting those on index cards and uh, then what do we do with them? <laughs> yeah, just passing the ball. No, go ahead, finish it. Okay, so, yeah. uh, so then uh, before you know it, I think uh, the, all the four of us were just brainstorming and writing these challenges on index cards. We would shuffle them up, set 30 seconds on a timer, and see in a co-op style if we could get through. Uh, we yeah. set a, kind of a dungeon crawl theme to it. Uh, so if you dropped a die or whatever, you would lose life. We had little counters for life. And if any of the party members, you know, died in, in, in battle, you lost. Yeah. So you had to make it through a stack of cards. What was it, right. like 30 seconds per card? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Uh, so okay. the funny thing, like, I want to talk about, I know this this interview isn't about Fungent Party, but it brings <laughs> back a bunch of memories. And I remember when we set this, we had like three versions of each card. And we had like 15 cards, uh, 15 of each. So there were like 45 cards. And then when WizKids signed it, Zev was like, um, I need like 30 more, 30 to 40 more original uh, things. I don't want them to all repeat. And we're like, sure, sure. You know, no problem, no problem. Um, so Marissa, do you remember some of those well, and things? Then we I, I remember him telling us too, like the zanier the better. And so it was right. just like a marathon of a few days, just like, coming up with crazy wild ideas and obviously Ms. Granger's like, finishing school yeah. right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> we, what was the one where I, I think it's in the game too I haven't played in a while where we used we we, we eventually added tongue depressors and we called them yeah. wands yeah. and so right. everyone was using wands to balance dice and do things and we had right. some where you <laughs> put all the dice of different colors in the box and you had to sort them to and yeah yeah I think we called it the jeweler <laughs> the jeweler <laughs> Yeah, just so, just so. Oh. I think it was put with Marissa under the table, yeah. and she was trying. We were trying to flick. Stuff. Yeah, like, I well, mean, Ms. Granger's finishing school was the one where you had to put the box on your head. Yeah, and and I don't know if people threw dice in it, but you had to walk across the room with it with the box yeah. on your head. Yeah, without it falling off. Too, like you and I, we kind of designed a little game on our own, and that was the first time I ever thought about ever designing, and it was inspired by Origins because that is that was my first big thing in games like going to origins and it was about the north market and doing like a little um chinatown north it's not market like chinatown sort of thing. but and, and yeah doing that was so fun for me and it's not anything anymore but that's where i got interested in designing more mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah fun time <laughs> yeah for sure All so right. if we had um five rules for game design what would they be brian go ahead and start us off here um I'm a big proponent of brainstorming. I, I think just getting as many ideas out as possible, um, write them down. No idea is too silly because you can always cut. Um, you can't, you can, you, you can put everything down on paper and then go, no, no, what were we thinking? <laughs> yes, I would definitely want to try this. I want to try this. Um, there's no harm in just writing everything down and coming up with as many ideas as possible because you can always cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Oh, so testing is huge. You know, as you're going through that list of huge things to do, try, like some things will quickly not work. <laughs> <laughs> you only like, know if you try. You right. Know. And like doing them over and over again, you can start to see those flaws. So testing a lot and testing often and testing with different people in Fresh person down. when you can is huge. Yeah. Uh, I'll go. Um, collab yeah. Collaboration. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're all co-designers, and um, you know, this is uh, what I would definitely call our first major uh, design. Um, but if it wasn't for you know people, these two like, kicking me in the rear end from time to time, I don't think any of this would have got done. So it, it's just like I definitely am someone that can admit like I need a shoulder to lean on through any creative process, uh, and I and. I mean, we're, we're educators. Brian was an educator as well. So I think we're all kind of, uh, you know, people that are, are very aware of the power of collaboration and working mm -hmm. together. And, and you find, yeah. I, I could, I don't think I could ever see myself designing a game by myself. Like, I just think there's so yeah. much value in sitting down with other people. I, I think that's really hard to do. Not, not that it's, not that designing with a group is easier, easy, because it's still hard, but there is just something about feeding off of other people's energies that really um, gets me going and really makes me want to work and like really go back to like, here's this prototype, now let's try it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think for me, um, one of the design rules is simple solutions to problems. I see one of the things I see from a lot of first time designers, because I was there, is you try and make things complicated just to be like, look how complicated and fun this is, where um, sometimes there is a need for that. But a lot of times, hi Kitty, a lot of times, um, feeling left the out. Simple, <laughs> the simple solution is the best because uh, people can easily get overwhelmed with decisions and processes and um, cognitive overload. And the more the difficult it is, the harder it's going to be to pitch your game to, and to sell it. Right. So. And lastly, I think des uh, design games that you want to play, that definitely helped us in this situation. Um, but even thinking about other games that I would maybe want to design in the future, it would only mm -hmm. be things that I'm truly interested in because you can pull from that and use things well, with that, so. Right, like the yeah. mechanics, I mean, this game in particular, I, we've play tested it so much and uh, I think we were I still have fun with texting it, yeah. earlier and, you know, looking through prototype art and everything. And I think one of my texts was like, I can't wait to actually own this game. Like, uh, yeah. and, um, you know, I, we're very much, all of us really are very much, you know, board game enthusiasts. We're kind of cult of the new. We always are moving in new games. We own tons of games. And uh, to actually sit with a game and play it, um, you know, and, and over and over again and still have fun with it, you know, I mean, that's, that's, for me, that was the, the design philosophy. Like if I, if there was yeah. ever a time I didn't want to play it, well, that was a problem we and we had to talk about it. And so, right. Um, yeah. yeah. I remember that almost flipped the table moment yeah. uh, that we had. Uh, we did a lot Dave, of good changes that day too. So. Yeah. There was something didn't go, go right. And it was just like, so disheartening. And, um, but, you know, I basically, it basically it came around to, um, well, let's not mope about it. Let's fix it. Mm -hmm. How do we fix it? Um, and that's what came out of it. So I think it's good. It's good to have those moments because if if you play test and after every play test you're like, wow, that's really good, you know something's wrong, right? Right. right. Because not it, it can't be good after every play test uh, um, initially. In my opinion, there's always something to fix or to tweak, right? So mm -hmm. that's my opinion, though. Oh. All righty. Um, I guess what's next for all of us? Hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's finish this first. I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, this this pandemic has been really hard. I think on everyone. I think it's especially hard on designers sometimes because we are so um, used to be able used to used to be um, used able. I can't even speak right now. It's, it's so frustrating. Um, <laughs> Uh, so used to being able to get together with people uh, to test things. And now we're kind of stuck in this digital realm. Um, and that makes it a lot harder um, because I'm so used to being able to just come up with something really quick, uh, you know, on my computer, print it out and we can test it. Uh, whereas it's a lot harder to get stuff up and running on tabletop simulator. Uh, so, um, but that, that being great. said, it what? just doesn't have that great feel too of like sitting across yeah. the table. Like yeah. even a bad play when you're sitting with your friends can be fun where on tabletop simulator, yeah. you know, alone at your computer and there's just yeah. not that interaction. Yeah. And I can see like, if I'm at a play test, I can see if someone's on their phone, they're bored. You know, mm -hmm. I can't see that on tabletop simulator. Yeah. So. Even just the hobby itself, you know, that's the biggest draw for me is being able to get together with people and enjoy their experience as you're playing a game, even if it's yeah. not one we're designing. Yeah. And so I'm really missing yeah. out on that too. <laughs> so in terms of what's next for me, I have a couple things I'm working on. Um, I am working on a superhero themed game. Um, it's been in the works for a while. Uh, it's kind of been put on the back burner, obviously, because of this. Um, that's the main thing I'm working on. I have a couple little games that I also work on, you know, on the side, but nothing that I feel proud of at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's gonna, 
uh, there. Um, and I know you guys had some ideas too, right? Yeah, I mean, we had some ideas, like, and that's to totally what they are. I mean, there's some games I've been working on for a long time. I mean, maybe someday I'd love to bring out that crab fishing game again. A, a good crab fishing game needs to exist. It is just right. ripe with potential. But uh, uh, I've been sitting on that for, oh my goodness, so many years. And uh, uh, but some other ideas that uh, we've been kind of kicking about. You know, I really like games with like contemporary themes. I think, you know, we, we have a lot of and non-fantastical themes. Um, yeah. You know, uh, this is a very much a fantasy, right? The dinosaur island, dinosaur mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Um, and, and so many of the games are set in the past. I just like these contemporary games that I know I can get why people aren't super into like, you know, just a game about you know, selling some product or, or <laughs> some sort of office existence. Uh, but sometimes those games fascinate me. I think they're difficult challenges. And when they hit, yeah. they really well. So um, I just wish, you know, more people, I say that and we're, you know, promoting and, and, and designing <laughs> fantastical dinosaur theme park right. games. But uh, I just, I just think those are cool. So some of the ideas are really about like, how can we set, you know, uh, games in, in the present day and yeah. just kind of doing stuff, doing jobs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, a fantastical idea I have been kicking around in my brain for years is a Battlestar Galactica sort of card like driven game just because I am obsessed with Race for the Galaxy as well. <laughs> and my first play of that Battlestar Galactica game was terrible because I had no context for Cylons, which if you don't, I'm sorry, watch the show, then play the game. <laughs> it's not a thing. It's just in my head. Yeah. That's all. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to wrap this up here. Um, the final question of the evening or morning, wherever you're watching, whatever time you're watching, um, what is your favorite dinosaur? Go ahead. Oh, my favorite dinosaur is probably the Brontosaurus. That long neck, so cool. He's so big, he's so graceful. I feel like I could ride him like a little princess. Glorious <laughs> animal. Yeah. Um, I, this is this is easy. Uh, yeah, it's funny because I think a lot of people, you know, love like the raptors stuff. It's the Triceratops. It's a hands down really? Triceratops. Why? Easy. Laying on the belly. Yes. That's Not even close. Because <laughs> you want to go through that. You want to have a, a, just a giant mound of poop to, yeah, to yeah. find out what's wrong with why they're sick. Yeah. Well, you don't get the berries out of there. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I also like the Stegosaurus. I just both those herbivores. I think are cool. Like some of the big yeah. car, uh, carnivores and stuff. They're kind of they're kind of scary. I should have gone with the comp. Compy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we all have to really love the compy. Yeah. yeah. I am going to go traditional, and I'm going to say Velociraptor, because I still remember that kitchen scene from oh. uh, Jurassic Park is so good. So good. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say later on when they escape in or when they get into the the office and they're trying to make the doors lock and um and they're struggling to try and get the shotgun with, like laura dern's trying to grab the shotgun with her foot and that little boy is just standing by his sister going come on come on come on i'm like why don't you just run and get grab the shotgun for her right <laughs> things, things you think later on when you're when you're you know almost 50 watching this movie on um on uh, uh bbc because it's on every weekend now um so <laughs> I can tell you how many times. It's funny. I own the movie, but when it's on TV, I'll stop and watch it. I, mm -hmm. I don't get it. I haven't seen it in a long time, but yeah. So that that gives um, everyone out there way much more information than they probably needed. Uh, I want to thank you guys for um, for joining us. And uh, my name again is Brian, and we've got Marissa and Dave. All designers on Dinosaur World coming to Kickstarter on September 22nd, along with Dinosaur on Roar and Right. We uh, thank everyone for watching and have a great night. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>